Oh, everybody in the entertainment industry or in the entertainment has an alter ego. That's the cat that will do everything that, you know, you won't do. But D. Brad and David Brad were too much alike. So it was something I love with Cross regardless. But I didn't work for MTV or VH when I interned, which is very important because they, I, this is in, uh, probably 1997, and this is before radio, radio and television were the same thing. And they showed me how they used to watch, MTV back then would watch BET to see what rap videos to play. Because um, I didn't even watch BET back then when I was in college. I went to a King University. Yeah, Jersey, Jersey. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm from Wilmington. I'm a Jersey guy. Okay. So yeah, so I'm Jersey. Penny Packer. Penny Packer. My sister over there. Penny Packer Drive. How about that? So, uh, <laughs> I went to Penny. I, I still work at Penny. I work over at Penny Packer School. But um, yeah, we always say Wilmington, New Jersey is like two degrees of separation from like anybody, from yep. the president to whatever. Yep. But um, so they were lost in short. They were watching every day. They were watching Rap City. This is back when I used to dish Rap City because I hated Joe Clay at the time and I hated everything about Rap City. So one day I got the courage to ask them because like every day at four o'clock, literally all the white producers on the 16th floor on 15 and 15 Broadway were sick and watch Rap City. So I would ask one day why, and one day they said, "Well, just how we tell what rappers to, to uh, put on our show, our station, because if they are doing well, then we know that in the black community that people are watching." So I kind of kept that in mind for no particular reason because I had no clue that I would end up at BET like seven months later. Long story short, I talked my way into BET um, and I worked on a show called By the Book, which was the first show that introduced. It's funny, everything that I've worked on at BET and after the fact was like, it turned out disgusting. But we were the first to introduce like black, black romance novels. And then um, it went on to what we what we saw. It was a show called Bottom Book. Then I, I talked my way into Rap City from there. Um, I didn't have a job. Like I went to DC with two hundred dollars in a dream. I got hired on the phone, and they said, "Well, we need you when, when you come." So I was like, well, "I can come, you know, next week." I just graduated. She was like, "No, it's Tuesday." She was like, "We need you here tomorrow." So I had my little two hundred dollars. I stayed in the Super Eight Motel, and then found out my cousin went to Howard about a month later. So after that, I was cool, and then. My job for Bobby was only six months. And we went there and I'm um, like, I think we introduced Yana Van Zandt to the mainstream before she got on Oprah. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these best-selling authors from Terry McMillan, all on um, for the rest of them, we were the first show to actually put them out there. And then that show was over and I tried to get on Rap City. And one day I decided to cold call the producer and I found out who was doing it and I called him up and I talked his head off and he just kind of brushed me off and said, yeah, yeah, all right, kid, yeah, just, if you ever get here, give me a call. And lo and behold, a week later, I was there and he would never hire me. Hire me. And then one day they had a, a rap battle. Like, BT in D.C. was real ghetto. Like, at any given, like, everybody knew Bob Johnson was, was born in Deborah Lee. Like, that was the old receiver. Like, we all knew that. Everybody knew that. Like, that was like the talk, like, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, uh, my business partner, we did an interview, and he can verify because we interviewed the, 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 the boxing commissioner, Larry Hazard, he used to roll Bob Johnson. Right. It wasn't me saying that, yeah. how, get like, how, <laughs> how niggers they all acted. <laughs> so that's how I was at BT. It was just really like in the hood. I used to call my home, but like, yo, like, it's like going to a club every day because the women, it was just crazy. Yeah. So I didn't want to come back to New Jersey, needless to say. And then for me, you know, being a red blood metal, so many gay men in DC. That I would walk out my house, oh my apartment, and come back in with like five numbers. I was like, this is heaven. I'm like, brothers, be gay, do your thing. Let's talk what I got to do. Like, it's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful. Never in my life did I not have to talk to women. Like, what? So, you know, I, it's not, it was not a ball. I had a ball. Um, but I was also young. So, understand this where I'm coming from. I was also young. So, then, long story short, I got a rap battle. I started rapping on stage because I had nothing to lose. And then, lo and behold, the producer gets on stage. He starts rapping. Real 70s, old school, like, and I'm just looking at this dude, like, are you serious? And everybody knew him, and he was like a cerebral guy. He didn't involve himself in things of that nature. So, everybody was cheering for him. And here I am, the guy no one knows, and I'm like, this old dude is playing me out. So I threw caution to the wind, so I just started rhyming, and I just ripped him apart from head to toe. And by the time it was over, everybody was like, yo, that was dope. Too bad you didn't get a job. <laughs> But lo and behold, he hired me years later. He said that's why. He said he, he said if he was going to go to war, he wanted a soldier like me. He needed someone that would throw caution to the wind. 
And that's what I did. He said, because the fact that you had no job, you had the audacity to sit on stage to say the things you said about me. He said, I appreciate that. And so that was my introduction to World Rap City. And as a production assistant, I was brought a young rapper named Eve, and nobody knew what to do with her. But being from South Jersey, hanging out in Philly, I was like, well, she's a Philly girl. I know what to do with her. Blah, 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 blah. So that was my first artist that they let me have on my own. And we, me and Eve worked together and thus you have what you have now. Um, it was all based on image. It was all based on the fact that I understood the science of MTV was watching. So at the time I was like, you know, I was the type of dude that you let me in. I was like, yo, these fools gave me the key to BT. Yeah. I'm, so I'm calling everybody I know from Philly. So yes, being sick, but I'm grabbing him up from Philly. Like, yo, we'll put you on freeway. So there was a, there was a couple years of Philly artists who were really doing very well. Yeah. And because I was from that area, so I was pulling everybody up. And yeah, say that again. Yeah, I put them on television the first time, and on and on and on. And I was fortunate enough. I I created Spring Bling when I was there. Um, I didn't know it was gonna stay what it was, and I was telling people, you gotta understand when I created the show, I was 20 something years old, and Uncle Luke's the mansion from the Two Live Crew with Big Tigger, DMX, and some weed. <laughs> and that is how that concept for Spring Bling came up. Yo! <laughs> The white boys got that Jordan on the TV, they, we need a show too. Play, play. Yo, we call it Spring, and the Uncle Luke said, Bling, and this is back in 98, and D-Mix said, Yo, son, that's it? <laughs> and we said, that's it, right there. You know, and I was a young guy. I was young, I was chasing women. I just didn't know that it was going to continue to be that way. Because I would try to improve it, and they would be like, get out of here, D-Grab, I'm sorry. You know, because it was making the advertisers, it was making the money. So that is when I went from, from a worker, a spoken will for the company that comes in eight hours a day, they have to pay them for lunch break, they have to pay the salary to an asset. Because now millions are coming into BBT. Millions of dollars. They're looking at these crazy black kids. And then it was all cool for me to be on the show until about the second year when I started going like, all right, man, this ain't really cool. Like, I understood it, but we need more. And then, then that's when the friction with me and BT, BT would start. Because I became known as the black guy. Mm -hmm. The guy in production meetings that we'd have. And I would say, well, you know, it's not, I, I love women too. But we need some balance. It shouldn't take a Michael Jordan sneaker commercial for most deaths whom he says to be a video to get played. That's crazy to me, you know. And everything I did, I felt I did with balance. You know, I felt that I was giving brothers a, an opportunity. So yeah, and sisters too. Yeah, my man Trick Daddy from Florida. Yeah, when you saw him playing a lot, that was me. And yeah, Trina too. And I introduced Trina. I put her on television first because I thought she had a really big black. On TV. It was just that simple. Oh, whoa, who's that? That's a new rap chick. Dang! Yo, get the camera. And that's how it was, and that's how easy it was. So I'm learning all of this and going, wow, like, you know, I'm putting subliminal messages in all of Eve's projects. I'm shouting at my homeboys at home, spelling out pet pack throughout the whole Rap City show. You know, playing little jokes. You know, I, I have on my reel where I would play with images with Eve, subliminal messages, you know, put Eve is hot underneath a flash frame. And you slow down, you see a black background. Red eye, red ass, he was hot. But the regular viewers not seeing us. And I tell people to prove my point. Maybe an album or a song that Eve has had has been a hit, but she's still famous. People still go to see it. This is based on image because I knew that MTV would take her. I knew that MTV would take Trina. I knew that MTV would take whichever artist that I was pushing a lot. So I was behind a lot of that during that era from like 90, from 98, 99, 2002. Um, but that was also when there was new energies. So I was actually doing their, their job for them. Mm -hmm. Because although I was giving, I, in my world, really, I don't, I'm not going to leave work. You're so good. In my world, really, you really do. <laughs> in my world, it was like, I was just giving brothers and sisters a chance. It was dope and it was cool, like everybody could eat. But underneath, they were using the energy and the vibration. I was there when the president brought in this band B2K and started to make, you know, Brother Mel's really feminine, you know, feminine because that's how he is. So I watched it go down. I, I had a best friend that I started, that I brought in the game, who decided that, and I don't care that he decided that he wanted to have an alternative lifestyle, I care less about that. But this is what happens in this industry. They play with colors. They, that's everything that black guy speaks about. Uh, dealing with chakra colors and the vibration, they play with it. They, 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 they it. They, they, it was it was prophesied the new religion within this age of new world music. You know, so nobody's selling on hip hop, and the powers that be know that. But you have 
you have like all the regular people like ourselves, and we'll look at, I don't even know who's out, um, Chief Keith, yeah. right? Young Thug. Young Thug, and we'll go in on them. Yo, what's that another? But it's kind of like I say, like, with, like I'm a huge WWE wrestling fan, and I tell a lot of the people that like, we've been arguing online, like, yo, y'all know, like, it's scripted. Like, one minute, if we want to be, we want to be smart and say, well, it's scripted, we know it's not real. But then on the other hand, you get lost in the character. That don't, you know what I'm saying? I can't, I know that John Cena is not real, but then also I start talking about what he need to do in the ring. Well, it's scripted, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's how it is with rappers. It's like, come on, like, on one hand, everybody's so, like, intelligent and conscious. But then on the other hand, we go, oh, man, Young Thug, man, he come out with, you know Young Thug is you know that they went and got some weak minded little kid that just wanted to live the American dream and they put him in a bubble. Mm -hmm. But, oh, I know, if you go look at the man, that means you're responsible. Now, so that means you might have to put your favorite rap album down. You might not like be able to like your favorite rapper no more. See, it's real easy to blast Young Thug because I can still love DMS. You see what I'm saying? But if I look at the reality and those who run the record labels, there's a system behind it. We all have an American dream. So I can sit here for the next 10 minutes and tell you about who's gay, who did what, but that is not what I'm here for because I understand that I was there. I, a lot of the people with all due respect that would tell you all of this, a lot of them are, were former artists that would have had to come to me and say, hey man, you want to do this show? I never answered to a rapper a day in my life, whether it was Jay-Z, whether it was Diddy, it wasn't going to happen. You came to me. So I was the guy behind the scenes. Wasn't no rapper ever telling me what they was going to do. Just like Lil Wayne, I said, well, I guess we're not having this show. And that's what it was. Because I'm not putting your, your artists on. So no rapper ever walked on that set told anybody from Rap City what to do. So I'm speaking from the dude behind the curtain standing next to Oz. And the reality of what it all is is that there is a machine. They do take advantage. We all, we all want to live an American dream. I know what it's like just to blow four, five hundred dollars a day. Like it's nothing legal. And be hanging with cats that's spending more than me. I know it's like being around my home, my home girl who's on the radio and she, I'm watching her throw $500 a night on weed and I'm watching just like it's all love, sitting next to that Christy Aguilera and we chilling and I don't even know it's her. I know it's like standing next to Dave Chappelle and she's like, hey man, you know, so and so and so. I know it's like standing there Jay-Z coming up like, yo son, you don't know what you do. But I'm so into what I'm doing, like, yeah, all right. He's seen it. I'm still writing, if he's sat right next to him, he's seen some high power person call me. She's seen it. Her godmother is on TV so much that it's regular to her. That world to my daughter is regular. So this is the perspective I speak of, and this is what they take advantage of. You have a dream, you want to live it. I tell people all the time, I was fortunate because I had a father in the house, and he taught me to the best of his abilities, how to have standing, what to be a man was. But I can tell you, making what I made, living that life, if I didn't have a father in the house, and I just watched my mom work three jobs, I can't promise you that I'd be sitting here. But I can promise you that I'd probably be sitting in that big behind office in my condo with a couple young ladies around me like I used to do with the best weed you want to have <laughs> and some money in my pocket and going to a bad fact was a Friday night I'm coming from I'm just at it I'm just walking up in the club at this point in time yes that's the life I live I but because I had a father who gave me standard when I'm in the limo with that president of that billion dollar company and he's sitting with his legs cocked open Looking at me like, you know what you got to do because that's the next step for you. I was the dead body that was coming. I used to date Kerry Washington's best friend. I, I was sitting right there. It was my girlfriend, me and my girlfriend, Kerry Washington, where she did her first movie. I can name, I can name all these other actors and directors out of mine. They did do like, yo, that's that kid right there. He's on his way. And everybody beat you knew. So guess what? Now you across that threshold. But there were a lot of doors that were open for me that I didn't understand because everyone in there, they come from a bloodline. I didn't know at the time. I heard things that I never paid attention. But my cousin was like Hollywood royalty. His name is Michael G. Moy. He was a co-creator of uh, Married with Children. He wrote every black sitcom there was, different shows. Mm -hmm. Silver Spoons, Sanford and Son, That's My Mama. Yeah. I didn't know that. And I always used to wonder why doors would open up. I would see people hustling so hard to get in. And I would walk in and show my face and they'd be like, come on in. But it was also something that they wanted. Because see, my cousin also dipped Hollywood too. He rolled out. It was unheard from for years. So everybody has a lineage. Jay-Z has a lineage. Everyone who makes it has a lineage from something or somewhere. But they take advantage of that because you have your bloodline, you have your family you have to live up to. Then a lot of the other people are just peripheral on the lines of young thug and just a young kid 
who probably was the follower. If you really went back and saw most of these dudes' friends, with the exception of Philly rappers, <laughs> most of them, they really said they shocked you or somebody channel that they really did because something about the city of Philadelphia. But, you know, but mostly. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love Philly. I'm a Philly cat, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but you know, but you know, so that's really what it is. They take advantage of all of that. So now you're sitting in a limo, like I was coming. Yo, Rick, really? You're my business partner over here. I got to talk over you. <laughs> so you sit in a limo. So you sit in, and this is how it goes down. You're looking at a dude that went through that Illuminati stuff. You're sitting in a, you do, we hang out three times, the third time I'm end up with the president of that station, that billion dollar station. You're sitting in the white room where everything's all white. He takes you to the clubs, you go to the clubs, he brings you to the after after parties, you have a long table, long white, long white out tables, you look over, oh there's Derek Jeter and his girlfriend. Oh, this the part, there's an NBA player, there's an actor there. You go there and then you know you sit in the limo with this dude, he's looking at you saying, what's up? Now's your time to go to cross that burning bridge. Me not even knowing, I don't even know how to get in that situation, let alone get out of it. I'm just looking out the window, but knowing that my career is So you watch the dude as he puts his foot on your financial freedom, or what you perceive as financial freedom. So we can all sit here right now and say, oh man, I would have done really? Especially when you know that 9.9 .9 times out of 10, the person sitting right next to you in the same position did the same exact thing. When they brought you to your party, you saw your favorite producer, writer, whoever, and you're like, wow, they're having fun at this party. We got a little skinny girl who got on his lap. Ha ha. It's not a girl. Wow. Oh then you go to another room and your favorite actress, you see her doing favors, and you're like, wow, I used to really look, think she was. So who's really, so who's really, so who's really gonna say no to that? And come back to this life that I've had to live. I have a child. I gotta do my thing. I gotta hustle. I gotta, I'm trying to, I, when I was in the game, traveling production company was easy. And when people and all the people that would talk about what these rappers and these people need to do, they're not there for you when you go through what I go through. Right. I have my daughter, I, I know the people that I have on my side community. That was one of them. And I can count on one hand. Right. There's another brother right there. That's right. But I was alone. All the people that talked all that, where were they at? But you know who was calling me? The same people that they told me to turn around. It was entertainers. I still to this day owe Nikki D two hundred dollars. Because she just put money in my pocket like yo D. You understand? So I had act I've slept on actors' floors and sofas before people in the conscious community opened their doors up to me. Mm. So all I'm saying is before we judge these people, let's look at the situation at Because you're looking at a dude who did it. And because you forget about it's easy to say what they should do, but you forget about real life. Like I still have a daughter. And so then your family falls apart. You just do a regular life. And it's regular life that happens that they forget to tell you about. When they tell, when everyone talks about what Jay-Z should do. So Jay-Z Jay should take everything he worked for, talk to the side. But guess what? His mom is taken care of, his cousins are taken care of. Can you really ask a man to trade his child's comfort so that y'all could have some truth? Mm. And then go right back on and turn the TV back on anyway. Mm. Turn the radio back on, I ain't listen to Chief. But I'm listening, I don't give a damn about you, girl. It's whatever, you know what I'm saying? It's the same thing. So. That's the reality of that industry, and it's really up to us. Like, they're not making anybody watch anything. That's why I don't make my daughter turn off the television. I'll, what I tend to do is, like, she knows I love wrestling and basketball, so I'll let her see dad get up and turn the game off, put the remote down, and go do something else. Because I don't, you know, and that's the reason why I got in the school system. I've got, I've got to involve myself in the school system. So when dad says something, she can't just brush me up like that's your dad because she's seen dad teaching children too, right? See? And she's seen me teach as well. So that was my thing. So I got out and started lecturing and started telling people. And I did what I needed to do. And I met a lot of good brothers and a lot of good sisters. So, and I had this little beautiful girl. So it was all worth it. But everybody's not built like that. Wendy Williams even told me that when I did her radio show. She knew people that he didn't say. She said, everybody's not built like you. And it took a lot, but I had a loving foundation where I had real good friends, the friends I did have that were there. So that is my story in a nutshell. I know I'm rushing because I know I got to move on with someone because she's going to stop. Thank you, mom. <laughs>